Okay, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly welcome you to our virtual five by five symposium addressing the provocative question, maybe will all radiotherapy be delivered in a maximum of 10, uh, five radiotherapy fractions. Um, and please um, don't be afraid. This is not um, a time loop where you're captured and caught and where you can't escape. We are indeed today in our fourth um, virtual symposium today addressing a pancreatic cancer, a very difficult, a very challenging indication for us radiation oncologists. So let's jump into the topic. This is what we try to avoid. Obviously pancreatic cancer, it has a strong predominance for distant metastasis. The majority of the patients will develop a distant disease progression, but we need to remind ourselves as oncologists, as radiation oncologists that about 30% of our patients will die of locally de um, destructive growth. And that's what you see here. And that maybe we as radiation oncologists try and can try to prevent. And here's the challenge, a very schematic drawing, which you have seen in your second year of med school, the anatomical relationship between the pancreas and the duodenum, which makes it tremendously challenging for us in radiation oncology, even using the latest technology and imaging devices to um, spare our critical organs at risk and still deliver a reasonable dose to our organs at risk. And that has been the reason for the initial experiences of using SBRT. I will not go into details, but these have been the early experiences, prospective trials <clears throat> using SBRT for locally advanced pancreatic cancer. You can see small patient numbers. And what I've listed here is the very high rates of severe gastrointestinal toxicity, which has been observed in particular to the duodenum ulcerations, stenosis, perforations, because of the difficulties of sparing the duodenum. And this was one nice summary, which has been published and very disappointing for us in radiation oncology and believing in the value of dose escalation, more dose did some good. So local control was improved, but that's a dose response curve, but unfortunately for toxicity and overall survival, it got worse with higher radiation doses. So from that, one could say, well, game over. What do you want to achieve as a radiation oncologist? If your modality, if your grace and race, um, they just do harm and make patients die earlier instead of later. But obviously we have maybe hope on the horizon. We have learned from the early experiences. We have technology which has improved. Maybe we will see in the couple of coming slides that we have better imaging, more accurate delivery of radiation. We have learned about what doses are truly required and needed and how in particular to integrate this radiation into systemic multimodality treatment concept. And also importantly, we have learned about the normal tissue dose constraints. So how much can we allow in terms of radiation and where do we need to stop to prevent harm to our patients? So I would like to start with a question to also make this expand more interactive experience, asking you three questions. One, very straightforward. Have you treated a patient with five fraction SBRT for locally advanced inoperable pancreatic cancer? Yes or no? And then I have prepared two cases here. Assume these are standard cases, standard performance status, reasonable age, um, patient with inoperable locally advanced pancreatic cancer. You can see here the CT imaging. Please don't ask for MRI and PET and multi slices. You just have this single image where you can see your gross tumor volume in relationship to the um, vessels and also to the duodenum, to the bowel and answer the question whether you would offer SBRT in this particular patient. Okay, so the first question, have you treated a patient with five fraction SBRT for locally advanced pancreatic cancer before? 30% um, saying yes and 70% saying no. So we do have quite some experience here in the audience. <clears throat> then the first question, um, the first patient having a smaller tumor, pancreatic body, um, distant to the duodenum, 73% um, would offer SBRT to an operable patient. And the second case, larger immediate contact abutting the duodenum, we have an SBRT 
agreement of only 40% and 60% would not offer SBRT. We will not go into the discussions about the alternatives. Maybe this will be addressed later in this symposium. So before I hand over to our podium and um, some housekeeping rules, um, please make this an interactive experience. Use the question and answering functionality. We will answer all your questions in a written format because time is usually too short to address all questions. So please be active. All your questions will be answered. On our symposium homepage, you can see here the um, this, well, black white thing, um, which you can scan and get to our homepage where you will see the presentations being recorded and where all the answers um, to the questions will be presented. CME credits will be sent via email to all participants and also you will receive a survey monkey for evaluation of the symposium immediately afterwards. I would like to thank Degro and Estro for endorsing our symposium and I would also like to thank Varian and Yuri for the kind support. With that, I would like to introduce you to our faculty and our speaker panel. Our keynote speaker today is Professor Maria Hawkins. Professor Maria Hawkins, I'm very happy that she joined today our symposium. We know each other for many years when I was a very young resident. Um, being um, in the big London Royal Marsden Hospital almost lost and um, well, I didn't kind of drown completely. Professor Maria Hawkins is a clinician scientist in precision radiation oncology. She's professor of radiotherapy at the University College London after having been an MRC group leader at the Oxford Institute for Radiation Oncology, so very prestigious institutes worldwide. She's also the clinical director of the CRUK City of London RadNet Radiation Research Unit and director of the translational research at the University College London and University College London Hospital and the Proton Center. Her research interest is obvious, um, it's GI malignancies, in particular pancreatic cancer and hepatobiliary malignancies, where findings of her strong radiobiology research and translational research are currently being investigated in two national, inter, um, two national studies. Maria, many thanks for joining our symposium. We're looking forward to your talk, in particular also for the discussion afterwards. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much for your kind introduction and um, uh, making me so so welcome in this um, to to the world. So I um, I was delighted to accept your to to do this presentation. So it was pancreatic cancer five times five. So I thought easy twenty five, and then we can go and um, have more other discussions in the meeting. But really, what I um, wanted to highlight um, is the, the scope of the problem uh, regarding the pancreatic cancer. So in the last 40 years, compared to other cancers, pancreatic cancer hasn't had a lot of breakthrough in treatments. The vast majority of patients are inoperable. And um, in, the last, in the next decade, uh, pancreatic cancer is expected to rise as the second cause of cancer death in 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 US. So for that reason, um, a lot of research is is focused to try and improve um, outcomes in pancreatic cancer. And this is perhaps we we want to contribute as radiation oncologists. Um, what's challenging about pancreatic cancer is a genetic disease, and not only there are somatic alterations, and a lot of them are resistant to multiple treatments, but also there are germline alterations. So the, um, it's, it's very challenging to find a, a targeted treatment for the cancer. What you have here on the right-hand side is with, with the orange arrow is roughly the time when we get to see the patients for, for, for treatment. And really, you can see we are finding patients very late in the disease when they are very close of um, developing metastatic disease. And whilst the pancreatic cancer itself is complex, we need to also remember the, the microenvironment um, and um, the, the fibrotic stroma surrounding the cancer poses a particular challenge. Now, are we 
thinking pancreatic cancer is a, a priori metastatic disease. So mathematical modeling reveals the kinetic of pancreatic cancers. And really, by the time we see um, a patient with locally advanced disease, the probability that metastasis um, exists is very, very high. So combining modality treatment and a multidisciplinary treatment approach are key for these cancers. So I, I view the pancreatic cancer as a continuum between resectable and unresectable. And really um, close discussion with a medical oncology surgeon and um, dietitian and other members of the, the multidisciplinary team helps us identify what it would be the best treatments for, for the patient. And I think as a radiation oncology, it's very difficult to, to have a, a voice uh, for the treatment of the disease, but it, and it's important we, we, we have one. So this symposium is about five fractions, but how many times five fractions? Five fraction, 15 or 25. So I'm going to start talking initially about the locally advanced pancreatic cancer. And just because there was some good news at ASCO, I thought I, I'd bring a couple of slides on the, the, the operable pancreatic cancers. So what we have to remember in the last um, 20 years, there has have been um, great advances in the medical oncology treatments. And if you look in 1997, where gemcitabine was identified as a breakthrough in standard of care, now patients and the median survival was six months. In 2015, it became 18 months. So the, the median survival has been trebled. And for locally advanced pancreatic cancer, we think the median survival is two years of more. So it's important we think of local treatment in these patients. And now as the, 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 the survival is in, in two years. So I just, for, for, for people who are not as old as me, I just thought I'd bring you the, the baseline trial LAPO7, in which, which is uh, before the Holfirinox era, which was um, a trial in which locally advanced pancreatic cancer was randomized to gemcitabine. And at the time we were testing erlotinib as a targeted treatment. And if after systemic treatment, there were no disease progressions, patients were randomized to continue with gemcitabine and then chemo radiation. And what was really disappointing from us from the radiation oncologist's point of view, that there was no overall survival benefit after chemo radiotherapy, despite four months of induction systemic treatment with gemcitabine. And um, um, median survival was more or less the same. Um, and, but there was a glimmer of hope it appears that with chemo radiation, there seems to be a significant local control benefit, as we've seen um, significantly reduce local regional progression. And also there appear to be a prolonged treatment free interval after chemo radiation. So for that reason, a local control in these patients is important in terms of controlling their local symptoms but also perhaps buying a short time without a systemic treatment. So as Matthias alluded earlier, um, an ablative treatment of five fractions or less uh, could be advantageous because of improvement or local control, also allow integration with more intensive systemic treatment. And now we are trying to use Fulfirinox or, or Gemabraxane. Um, brings patients convenience and is cost effective. But really 
when we give the, the, the doses of radiotherapy and we think about now, are they curative doses or are they ablative doses or palliative doses? So I've just done here a sort of quick table looking at the, the current techniques, uh, starting with conformal radiotherapy and then IMRT and then what I call low, low dose SBRT. So uh, what uh, most of us are thinking it's standard SBRT. The biological um, equivalent dose uh, with an alpha beta of 10, it's about 60 gray. And you can see the, the two year overall survival is less than 20% in, in all groups. So perhaps when we're giving doses of around 50 gray and with the low dose SBRT, um, we are doing excellent palliative treatments. So when we look at the radiation dose escalations in pancreatic cancer, in UK, we've just completed scale of two trial where we increased the dose for 50 gray in 28 fractions to 60 gray in 30 fractions. And a lot of people do higher dose SBRT from 33 gray to 35 or 40 gray in five fractions. Do we see actually improved survival um, or local control? Is this small increase of dose, um, in, will that have any influence? Um, we know that pancreatic cancer is very radio resistant. And if you look at the tumor control rate, so TCP control, the doses we are using now are in the palliative doses. Um, so really what I am thinking, we need to go more than 100 gray to have impact in the outcome of our patients. Um, in terms of tumor control rate and, lo and local control. And this is regardless whether we're using um, conventional or SBRT. Um, so we think we need more than um, 100 gray. So if we look at um, two year overall survival of all the data between conformal radiotherapy and um, SBRT, you can see with SBRT, we see 26% um, two year overall survival, uh, while with conformal is, is about sort of 13%. But when you look at the date of the publications of this data, perhaps the SBRT um, is given also in conjunction with, with better systemic treatments. So, so we, that's something we need to consider when we use five fractions. The other things that ar arise after um, SBRT is because the margins are so tight, as we are trying to avoid, avoid normal tissue toxicity, which can be catastrophic, the patterns of failure is different and is local regional. And you can see published data now and, and here you can see mapped out nicely where the tumor failed. So the failures are in the region of low doses we used to give with a conformal or fractionated radiotherapy. And now people are thinking, should they be using SBRT with a, an elective nodal type CTV of 25 grain, five fractions to avoid the local regional failure. So, we, we just need also to think a bit more about how we do SBRT. So I think I've showed you that unless we significantly increase the radiation dose, the survival might not be better and we might have the problem of local regional failure. So in, in Astro 2019, Chris Grain uh, came with this very intriguing data looking at a hypofractionated ablative um, radiotherapy. So most patients had um, uh, fulfirinox for four months. And then, um, because at the time, I don't think MR-Linux were available, 
um, he was looking to give doses of um, 75 gray in 25 fractions or 67.5 gray in 15 fraction. And she, he showed a, 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 an amazing um, median overall survival of 64 months. And I, I must remind you that the SBRT survival was about 20, 28 months. But what, were there any changes from the conference to publication? So when he published the paper, and once they cleaned the data, the, this a very ablative radiotherapy of a 100 gray equivalent still showed a 10% increase at two years overall survival um, with significant lower local regional failure at one and two years and compared to what we've seen with SBRT. Um, and an amazing median overall survival of, of 26 months. And there's two key elements to, to think about here. One, the induction chemotherapy, which is uh, called Firinox, and, and two, the, the dose of radiation of um, 100 gray equivalent. So I just put in the bottom that we this is equivalent with 10% with increase in two, two, two year overall survival. The other thing that um, they, they looked at, it's what's happening. So we don't have any good biomarkers in, in pancreatic cancer and CA99, it's, it's sort of uh, what we call an, um, an old fashioned type biomarker. But what he showed that if there was a decrease in CA99 after the induction chemotherapy, the patient seems to have a better outcome and also a reduced incident of local regional failure. So perhaps when we consider our patients for SVRT, we need to look what's happening with a CA99 for the patients who are secreted. And this is in the absence or any other uh, biological or imaging biomarker we have. But this might give us an indication on how to select the patients for radiotherapy and whether to consider a more ag aggressive approach. Lastly, I had to find this in the supplementary table because it wasn't in the main paper. You're going to ask me, would, um, 100 gray give you toxicity. So yes, it, it will. And what we need to think, is this toxicity acceptable? You can see 8% of patients had upper gastrointestinal bleeding grade three. There was also the uh, bile duct toxicity. Um, and interestingly, some patients had vertebral body fractures which is something I've never seen in pancreatic cancer be before. So we need to think about what are the, the, the elements on toxicity uh, also away from the, the, the GI tract. So we, we've seen similar data published with um, in pancreatic cancer. So the, the, the Bure Consortium published similar outcomes. And if you look at the ablative doses from other series, I put them the, in the middle, the Chris Crane data. I couldn't scale the graphs, but almost publication shows about a, a sort of, you can see um, here when the BD is more than 70 at two years, it's about 40%. So there seems to be a, a trend that giving equivalent of 100 gray um, might give an improvement in overall survival in a group of patients who have received um, at least four months of systemic treatment. So this is something perhaps we need to test prospectively. We know that technology offers the opportunity for dose escalation, and I commend the MR Linux group who are able to um, dose paint to, to 50 gray. And that's definitely something uh, we need to investigate further. But for the rest of us who don't have access to an MR Linux, perhaps we should consider the, the hypofractionated uh, regime. So I just put a table here to think about what would be 
um, the um, sort of pros and cons of the five fractions versus 15 or 25 fractions. So in terms of systemic treatment with SBRT, we'll, we, we rarely use it. Um, we are not, so I'm, I, I'm not using SBRT if the tumor is invading or abutting the bowel, the stomach, or the duodenum. Um, and also with SBRT, we don't typically cover the lymph nodes. Um, the hyperfractionation would be more convenient when the, the tumor is very close for the critical structure. And for SBRT, the, the 50 gray, I, in, in my view, unless you're using an MR-LINAC and daily adaptive, the tumor has to be at least one centimeter away from the critical structures. Um, and the other thing, the hyperfractionated or standard, they, they cover the, the lymph node. And we don't know yet if, is it important to cover the, the lymph nodes? We think it might be, but we don't know which patients. In terms of local control, whether that definitely we see better local control with SBRT. The other thing, the lymphopenia is important and it's emerging as a sort of surrogate for survival. And we see less of that with SBRT but the lay toxicity could be higher. Um, however, as I show you with uh, um, Chris Crane's data, that with 15 fractions uh, to 67.5 grade, there is risk, or, or standard fractionation to 75 grade, there is still risk of lay toxicity. In terms of patients, convenience SBRT is definitely better. So I just stopped there and I just want to to move a bit to what I put here in inverted comma as resectable pancreatic cancer. I don't think we should get into debate what's resectable and borderline resectable, but how do we use, how many five, would you give five fractions or more here? So here, here is a, a summary of key recent clinical studies looking at the neoadjuvant treatment in pancreatic cancer. And I highlight two studies. At the top is Priopank, which you um, use it Priop GEMRT uh, with 15 fractions. And at the bottom is Alliance with five fractions. In the Alliance study, there was neoadjuvant uh, modified fulfirinox and, and SBRT. And this is a summary of key findings that specifically for Alliance, the, the results were, were very disappointing. I'm just going to just show you something interesting from pre or punk study. So this is the, the, the schema of the phase three trial and the patients received 36 grain, 15 fractions. And this was done be, before Fulfirinox. And I think pre or punk two is, is addressing the questions about Fulfirinox and the GMRT arm. But what's interesting uh, whilst the median overall survival was similar, and, and this is their initial report, which is the JCO presentation, the median disease-free survival was similar. If you look at the median local regional failure free interval with the prio chemo RT, this wasn't reached. So if you look at the survival curves, in these patients, what you see, so here, if you look at the overall survival, what you see that's interesting, for 12 months, nothing happens. The curves are on top of each other. And really, these patients are patients with metastatic disease who whatever we do uh, will not benefit of local treatment. But at two years, the curve starts to separate. And you can see in the, the local regional recurrence, they definitely appear to be some, some benefit um, after radiotherapy. And what's amazing, just uh, last week at ASCO, there was an update. And at five years follow-up, there's definitely an improvement in survival with pre-operative chemo RT, which is statistically significant. So 20% of the patients are alive at five years. And also 
there is better local regional um, disease control, which is statistically significant. I'm sorry that I don't have the full data of the presentation, but we're looking forward to this uh, publication. So this is the, the, the good news from ASCO. And I'll just go to the not so good news from the GI ASCO on the Alliance trial. Now what's to remember about this trial? While this is a randomized phase two trial, the arms are not comparable. It was a pick a winner design. So really in the um, radiotherapy arm, patients received one cycle less on modified Folfirinox prior to surgery. And this was replaced with SBRT. So if you look at the arm B, which is the uh, chemo radiation arm, what really was unfortunate that significantly more patients progressed. So you can see six patients progressed versus three in the chemo arm, and also um, significantly less patients proceeded to, to surgery in the, um, the chemo rad arm because of metastatic disease. So unsurprisingly, um, the median survival was less with a modified fulfurinox and, and radiotherapy, um, while the event-free survival was, was the same. And what's interesting, um, when I looked at this data again after um, the GI ASCO, the CA99 in the modified fulfurinox, so in the radiotherapy arm, was twice as high um, as in the fulfirinox arm. So really, was the radiation group, just by chance, because the patients were not stratified on the CA99, a high risk group? While, 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 and this would this um, explain the, the high risk of metastatic disease and patient drop, dropout? I don't believe it's possible that a single, an extra single cycle of Fulpirinox contributed to such di discrepancy, but the numbers are very small. So just coming to a con conclusion to, to my talk is that in pancreatic cancer, metastatic disease drives survival. The systemic treatments are improving at the same pace with our radiation technology. And we have to remember that disease-related mortality is still common due to local disease. The dose and fractionation need to be tailored to clinical situation whenever an operation and whether an operation is possible. So for the inoperable patients, ablative radiation might be preferable, provides better local control and reduces the risk of catastrophic events um, it will, we think that the emerging data for a hundred gram more equivalent shows that will contribute to improvement in survival, but we have to have a risk adapted approach. And really what we need, um, it, we need trials to, to show that. In the operable group, what's interesting is that the high dose might not be preferable because it's making surgery more difficult and increases the risk of post-operative events. But now we, with the Priopank, we have some initial evidence that radiotherapy contributes to improvement in survival. However, we need, still need to have a risk adapted approach. And for me, the cards are still on the table between SBRT and 15 fractions. And to show that we need trials. And the other thing that's missing is that we don't have any biomarkers to show which patients we should select and not only to receive radiotherapy, but what type of radiotherapy. Um, could we use blood or imaging biomarkers to help us um, deliver better tailoring of the treatments? And should we try and better work as a multidisciplinary team meeting with our surgeons and medical oncologists to make sure we're giving the right treatment? I'm going, this is the end of my last slide. Um, 
where I say 5, 15, 25, I'm still not sure where next. Um, thank you. Thank you, Maria, for this excellent presentation. Um, I would like to start with a question. We also have some questions already um, in this system. So if you would like to ask questions, please use the functionality. You made quite a strong point on the, on the dose escalation aspect. How certain are you that the studies which reported the dose effect relationship have been well controlled for the other factors such as size of tumor, tumor burden, location? Um, can you comment on that question? So you're, you're making an excellent point. So um, we don't have that data. So the, um, most of these studies are in single institution studies with tumor, so GTB volume around 15 to 20 cc, and the PTB volumes for the SBRT are very small because the margins are tight. Most, so the, the moderately hyperfractionated, so the 15 and 25 fractions um, from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group are given with either abdominal compression, um, on-rail CT and combined CT, and um, patients fasting. Um, so, so it's not only that the tumors are very small, the immobilization and motion management are sort of a hundred percent. So um, it's in, in the, um, yeah, whilst in the, in the preoperative setting, these are not so important. So if I understand your point correctly, um, you would, we have quite some certainty that, or some, some assurance that there is a dose effect relationship in small tumors, which have favorable location and in the setting of high technology motion compensation and very tight margins whether we can extrapolate these findings to, I would call it a more typical case, which we see more frequently now practice, pancreatic head tumor, three centimeters, four centimeters in the diameter, immediately abutting the duodenum, that is, needs to be interpreted with high caution. I, I agree. And I think that the, the, what I'm not sure is how good the radiologist and imaging is to tell us about the lymph node involvement we know from surgical series that the lymph node involvement is very high. And that's why the, the lower, the, the initial SBRT data, where there wasn't a lot of systemic treatment incorporated, they, they, there was lymph node failures adjacent to the um, irradiated area. Um, I, I think the four, at least four cycle of systemic treatment will mitigate some of the microscopic lymph node disease, but I'm not sure yet we know how to select who to give elective nodal irradiation or who not to. Another question I've seen in the chat here, um, very important question to start with. Do you offer SBRT to patients outside of a clinical trial? Any pancreatic pan um, cancer case? So, so it is difficult. Because at the moment, we don't have any trials in, in the UK, but we scallop to our um, national trial closed a few months ago. And um, I, a lot of the patients benefit from having some local control. I'm offering SPRT with 33.5 gray in five fractions because I don't have an MR-LINAC and I'm concerned about the um, a very high dose toxicity. Just specifically, I can see um, that, that perhaps there is, all the patients are treated with abdominal compression or, or um, in breast hold. Another question I would like to ask is about the Alliance trial, where they replaced more or less a cycle of chemotherapy um, with um, the local SBRT. So it was kind of, um, having two kind of modifications, changing the systemic intensity and adding a local treatment component. If you would design it, to, or do you use SBRT as an addition to systemic therapy or also as a replacement for some component of systemic therapy, 
maybe because of concerns of toxicity. So do you add SBRT on top and integrate into systemic therapy as is, or do you make space for it? Yeah, so this is difficult because, you know, you've had the TNT approach in, in rectal cancer. So are, are we, are, should we do a TNT approach where all the chemo is given and then the radiotherapy and then surgery or, or not? Is this what you mean, or you mean on inoperable patients? Yeah, inoperable patients. Yes. Inoperable. Yeah, yeah. So it's so it's all your your uh, sort of trying to to combine a systemic and local regional approach. Personally, I don't think dropping one cycle of modified fulfurinox will make a difference, and also reducing the chemotherapy. The, so the modified fulfurinox was a ten percent reduction in the systemic treatment component. But a lot of patients have, because of hematological toxicity, a 25% reduction in dose. So um, the fulfirinox, uh, it's quite difficult to, to tolerate for some patients. I, I think for systemic treatment is key. And I try and introduce the radiotherapy once the whole of the systemic treatment is completed. You have briefly mentioned the PreOPENC2 trial previously, and um, this um, looks at um, randomization of fulfirinox versus um, gemcitabine-based chemo radiation therapy plus gemcitabine. Wouldn't it be um, more interesting nowadays to look at fulfirinox versus um, fulfirinox and then gemcitabine-based hyperfractionate radiation therapy, as we've seen now the results of Priopunk 1. What is your opinion? No, so thank you. You raise an excellent point. Is um, uh, unfortunately, Priopunk 2 doesn't ask the, the right question anymore uh, because we have the Alliance data, all, the, all this information about Fulfurinox. But this is for, this is for us to, to learn how to, to, to undertake the next trial. Um, and with the data we have now, perhaps we should think of, of a trial which takes the best of Priopunk 1, Priopunk 2, and, and Alliance. Exactly. I, should, I, I, fi I think the same. We should um, do something in combination of these two results we have seen now. Thanks. And, and the, the point you're making is, a TNT approach is something we should consider in pancreatic cancer. But what's challenging to know is it, whether 15 or five fractions should be included as radiotherapy. One could include that as well as a randomization. There's another question in the chat here, um, asking more a technical question. Um, about motion management technique. Um, do you think there's a need for motion management technique in pancreatic cancer, breathing motion compensation? And if so, um, which one do you prefer in your practice and which is kind of also kind of evidence-based? So I think the, definitely we need to have motion management. In my clinic, we use abdominal compression uh, because this is the equipment we, we have. <clears throat> Also, well, not all patients can tolerate um, breast hold. Um, the other thing what I find challenging to, to, to control is the peristalsis and the gas and the gastric filling. Um, but it's easy to do the, the um, um, abdominal compression. Okay. Um, you also mentioned the um, kind of potential value of Emma Linac. Um, I always said very much difficult is on going into the field of pancreatic SBRT because in a comb beam image, it's very difficult to actually see something which you can target, not even speaking of organs at risk. I'm not sure whether we're going to improve results and outcome and survival with an MRLINAC, but at least what I'm quite certain of is that we improve the safety profile, but by not putting a very high dose in the wall of the duodenum and then in the stomach. We could kind of continue for ages with the discussion. Maria, thanks for, for, for joining our symposium. Thanks for also staying here for the final discussion. And I would like, like, like to hand over to Dr. Matija Pavic, a radiation oncologist here at our center 
at the University Hospital in Zurich, um, asking the question whether there also could be a value for radiation oncology for SBRT in a very different setting of pancreatic cancer, namely in the metastatic setting with the aim of palliation. Mattia, please. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. And after seeing this excellent presentation and a lot of data for SPRT in locally advanced cancer, we will now have a focus on palliation and see if SPRT also works for that purpose. During the last years, we have seen an increase in overall patient cancer cases worldwide. And as you see here at the right side, we see that what we've already heard at diagnosis, the majority of pancreatic cancer patients has already either a distant metastasized disease or local regional advanced disease. So therefore we expect an increase in total number of patients with these stages. And as you consider the anatomy already shown today, um, we see that the pancreas is located um, in a proximity to very sensitive organs at risk, like the duodenum, the bile duct system, but also pancreatic nerve plexuses and the celiac ganglion. And by this uh, proximity to organs at risk and the local destructive growth, this cancer is prone to symptoms. You see here on the right side, um, the most prevalent symptoms in pancreatic cancer patients. And I want to point out on pain symptoms of primary tumor located mostly in the upper abdomen and back and prevalent in up to 80% of all patients during their course of disease. And the local destructive growth also today already mentioned is um, confirmed by the Johns Hopkins postmortem study published in 2009. And the, this was an autopsy program um, done in patients with end-stage pancreatic cancer and the authors found that 30% of all patients died with locally destructive disease. And standard therapy for advanced metastasized disease, just briefly to memorize this, is a multi-agent chemotherapy, NAP, paclitaxel, the so-called abraxane, and gemcitabine, or even in fit patients, ECOG 0 to 1 fulfirinox. And we have seen an increase of the still limited prognosis, but still there is an increase of median overall survival. 2011, um, 2011 reported to median of 11 months. But we have also seen previously in the other talk that uh, these patients, when you combine also um, the one um, scheme before the other later on or the opposite, they have even a more prolonged median overall survival. So we need an effective and durable symptom control. And the ASTRO guidelines 2019 are really clear in that regard. So we have a consensus and 100% of all pay, um, experts voted that palliative radiation treatment is recommended for selected patients with metastatic disease for symptom management. But however, quality of evidence was moderate. And there are some retrospective studies and only a few prospective studies reporting symptom control after radiation treatment. And if we look here at these results um, with more standard palliative doses, we know for like, for example, bone mats, um, of one to three times eight gray, or in this um, second trial, majority of patients got 10 times three gray, we see that we have an overall pain relief of not so bad, 60 to 90%, but only 7% of all patients have a complete pain relief with a short um, median duration of only 2.5 months. When we increase the radiation dose to median of 46 grays or even 65 grays, conventionally fractionated, we have a higher um, rate of overall pain relief up to 100%, but notably a complete pain relief of up to 60%. Median duration, unfortunately, not reported. So in conclusion, we can say pain relief rate gets higher with higher doses of conventionally fractionated radiation treatment but there is a major drawback of this treatment, and this is the long duration. 
And during this time, patients cannot undergo full dose systemic treatment, which we have seen is the mainstay for these patients. This paves the way for a high dose, short timed radiation treatment, which is SPRT. And we have seen previously some data and have seen that SPRT can or is effective and um, so-called has an acceptable toxicity profile an acceptable rate of toxicity when performed in five fractions. And the major advantage of this treatment is, of course, the short treatment time, which allows a better integration into systemic treatment regimens. But let's see if SPRT also really works for um, palliation of symptoms. As I've already mentioned, there are some prospective radiation trials looking also at um, symptom control. And one of these trials is the well-known phase two trial of Herman et al. 2015 published, evaluating gemcitabine and SPRT for locally advanced pancreatic cancer. And they looked also at the pancreatic pain score measured by the question um, quality of life questionnaire pancreas 26. And what they have seen is a significant decline of this pancreatic pain score four weeks after <laughs> SPRT. Two retrospective um, studies I want to share with you. They looked at SPRT um, in elderly or medically inoperable patients. And both of these trials also reported symptom control. You see here the respective symptoms. Um, you see the response rates here, the same for the other trial um, um, downstairs here. And you see that in up to 80%, um, you have an improve of pain symptom after SPRT. You see here also the median, um, median dose, 28 grain, five fractions. It's really a palliative dose. And here um, they gave either one fraction or three fraction of radiation treatment. And the response rates are pretty comparable between the two trials. So, that SPRT works for pain management was confirmed by this systematic review published 2018 by Bouvenge et al. And they looked on efficacy of SPRT on pain relief. In total, 14 trials were um, in the end evaluated, some prospective, some retrospective. <clears throat> Authors found that overall pain relief of 85% reflected here, complete response rate for 54%, uh, which is comparable to what we have seen retrospectively gathered data on high dose conventionally fractionated radiation treatment. Only one study um, reported pain relief, onset of pain relief, which was after two weeks. And one study reported the very important result of pain-free survival. And this was after SPRT 24 weeks, meaning six months. When we think um, at the slide I shown um, in the beginning, um, we had with standard palliative doses a median duration of 2.5 months. Um, the toxicity um, is not negligible, but still um, we have a G3 toxicity or higher um, of 8%. And in the end, we can say SPRT for palliation and pain management seems to be effective, but we have to acknowledge all of these trials did not um, look at pain as a primary endpoint. And there was no systematic reporting of pain here. This recently last year uh, published study um, by colleagues of Stanford uh, Cancer Center um, underpins the relevance of this topic SPRT for palliation in pancreatic cancer. And they looked at 27 patients retrospectively with one to three metastases. And um, all of these patients received SPRT to the primary tumor, either in one fraction or in five fractions. 17 of these patients had pain before SPRT with a median um, numeric rating scale of five. And what we see here is that the numeric rating pain scale declined significantly after SPRT. I want briefly to point out to this information, most patients had prior chemotherapy, but only seven of all these 27 patients received 
Now, these days, modern systemic treatment regimens of Forfirinox or gemcitabine, Abraxane. And only one of these seven patients with modern chemotherapy had pain before SPRT. So we cannot really um, conclude something on these patients about the effect of SPRT. G3 toxicity, um, acute and late, was 7% each. And I want to show you just briefly the conclusion of the authors of this retrospective study. And they say they reserve SPRT only for those with oligometastatic disease with good systemic control after chemotherapy because of the complexity and risk of toxicity of the treatment. And of course, they say patient sele selection criteria are important in the future. So speaking of risk of toxicity, we have already mentioned it before. There is this new device, MR Linux, and by the MR Linux, you have the possibility and the great advantage for daily replanning. So daily, um, daily scanning of the anatomy of the day. And we have seen or already heard that the organs at risk have a high interfraction variability. You see that nicely here, Powell in green, and we have this big air bubble, which um, leads to the fact that now all the anatomy is a bit changed. And this can be um, tackled or um, accounted for on a MR Linux. Only briefly, we have here a retrospective analysis on 35 um, patients with locally advanced cancer. And this um, analysis looked at um, dose escalation. We have heard before that um, we aim to give more um, uh, dose or higher doses in total. These patients got five times 10 gray and with a hotspot. And after a median follow-up of 10 months, only 3% G3 toxicity. Of course, of note, this was a retrospective um, trial. So this could translate um, into lower toxicity potentially. And by that, I want to conclude my trial by summarizing um, my talk, sorry, to, by summarizing that yes, we have data to support the effectiveness of SPRT, mostly retrospective for palliation and in particular pain management. And there is indeed a strong rationale to give a short treatment, a short and effective treatment because then we can better integrate radiation treatment into systemic treatment, which is the mainstay for this patient, um, for this pancreas patient. We have some key challenges we should um, um, approach in the near future. We have to keep risk of toxicity low. We have to show and prove that uh, risk of toxicity is low when we combine for free renox and SPRT in metastasized patients. And we have also to define value um, of SPRT on symptom control in patients receiving these modern systemic treatments as uh, effect on pain was also shown uh, by chemotherapy itself. So also my conclusion is we need well-designed prospective trials and for this purpose, we need um, prospective trials looking really at symptom and pain control as primi primary endpoint. Thank you, Mattia. Let's have a final discussion. Maria, who wants to start? Yeah, so I'm going to start. It's just, um, it's amazing that we've discussed that 80% of the pancreatic cancer patients are presenting with metastatic disease. And there's so little data about radiotherapy to palliate their symptoms and specifically local control. And um, perhaps this is a sort of um, highlights the nihilism of medical oncology on the use of radiation. And only now there are better systemic treatments. We have started to consider that radiotherapy could help palliate symptoms. Um, and and you're right. I think Mattia, go on. Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but um, you are right that um, maybe they did a little bit, yeah, um, consider to under consider our um, possibilities to treat as 
we can palliate symptoms. There are, of course, also other treatment options to reduce pain or control pain. But at the same time, we have also an effect on local control. And this should not be um, um, uh, forgotten, as we have seen that 30% of the patients, this was, of course, one uh, investigation, but still 30% died with locally destructive disease. So, so I think that's a, a fantastic opportunity to work closer to the medical oncology colleagues, because if you look at the Conroy data and all the other trials uh, they're trying at the moment with the targeted agents, um, it's pretty a sort of a, a lot of their phase two trials are negative. And perhaps in the metastatic setting, combining um, radiation for local control um, it might help identify a subgroup of patients who would uh, have better quality of life um, in in the in the future, and and uh, and and you know there. Are, I was just looking when I was preparing for this talk. Um, in terms of published data, there's probably three or four thousand patients reported SBRT publications from all the what's been published. But if you look at the medical oncology, there's sort of 10,000 of patients who receive various systemic treatments in pancreatic cancer to try and, and find a better uh, systemic treatment. So the, the opportunity to, to, to incorporate palliative radiotherapy is, is, is um, really great. Which was also not an easy discussion. Um... We have now in the final steps of um, opening such a trial in a randomized way using SBRT as a palliative treatment in metastatic pancreatic cancer. And one of the key challenges was the discussion with medical oncologists, how to integrate and when to integrate radiation, in particular in an academic environment. You can do a clinical trial in the first line setting. And then the patient quickly deteriorates and then it is first of all, difficult to integrate a local treatment and also for the medical oncologists, well, they want to run their first line clinical trial. So that was one of the key challenges to convince our colleagues that we get a spot in these large numbers of patients. I mean, that's the key message. This is large number of patients where we can test it and maybe they make some space um, not having a first line systemic treatment strategy where we can implement it. Maybe another question which I've seen in the chat, and um, people are very active um, in terms of target volume definition. I think this was a very good one. How would you adapt your target volumes, Maria, in terms of fractionation? Um, would you use smaller safety margins and SBRT, large and conventional fractionation, and also curative versus palliative setting? How would that impact your target volume concept? The target volume, we tend to, to really include the macroscopic tumor, not um, as you we have seen in your talk also some um, considerations about uh, elective nodal volumes, but uh, certainly for palliative purposes, we include the macroscopic tumor volume um, and just, just a short PTV margin. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what you do at your center, but um, this, the main reason is to be try to just have a high dose where we need it or we assume we need it and to really spare the organs at risk. That's the background. Matthias, oh. may I ask, I mean, small margins, what is small? Um, is it a millimeter, five? Um, well, but, yes, dynamic. You're... What is small in your trial? More accurate, um, it's five millimeters. We, um, in, in some situation, you could consider also going um, um, just uh, down to three millimeters, but it, usually we, we take five millimeters, GTV to PTV margin, yeah. So this is for specifically the, sorry, Maria. Is this for the palliative setting? This is for the palliative, but also okay. as well for the, uh, let's say curative for the locally advanced setting when we, um, we want to achieve local control, but not only symptom control. It's the same, we use the same margin there. Maria, um, how's your practice? So in the palliative setting where I have to treat the pancreas, um, I, I use a dose of 25 gram five fraction, which is high dose palliation, but the tumor, the gross tumor volume gets 30 gray, 
And I define that as the macroscopic tumor with a five millimeter margin. And to that, I put a centimeter and a half margin for the, the sort of to treat the peri-regional lymph nodes. And that centimeter and a half margin gets 25 gray. I've got no evidence for this, but I, I, I want to give a treatment that's effective. So I, I give a dose to the tumor, but some dose to the surrounding, um, especially at the celiac axis area. And the, there's a, the lymph nodes in that area need to get some treatment. But um, so 25 gray, it's, it's safe. Um, and that's it's a bit better than 20 in, in five. I have no evidence for this. But, but it's Maybe the final question, Mattia. Final question for you. Final question for me, yes. You, but, you, you. I just wanted to compliment that it's interesting because uh, when we have a tumor which is really abutting, really nearby the duodenum, or you even are not sure is there an infiltration, then we do also sometimes of like a two volume concept. And this is now, um, I told the, the, the standard uh, before, but we do sometimes these two volume concepts where we also cover at least five times five, so 25 gray. So this, this seems to be, um, here we have an overlap, yeah. Okay, I, unfortunately, I think we have to end the discussion here. It's now 10 minutes past six. Um, um, Maria, Mattia, many, many thanks for preparing the talks, for engaging in the discussion. Um, thank you very much. Um, we will send some presents afterwards. Enjoy the evening and thanks for joining. To everyone else, also thank you very much for your interest, for joining our um, symposium once more. I would like to remind you that we have one more session to go next week on the 17th of June. Let me correct this very quickly. It's a seven, not a zero. Um, um, lung cancer, Professor Suresh Senan, so everyone who enjoyed the symposium, please join us again next week. I wish everyone a sunny afternoon and evening. Please enjoy the evening and see you soon. See you, stay safe. Bye everyone.